Uh, I'll acknowledge uh, that Royal Roads University rests on the traditional ancestral lands and waterways of the Lekwungen and the Kusatsun families. And I am so very grateful to be a visitor here and to have the opportunity to live and work and play on these beautiful lands that have been stewarded from, from uh, these families for time immemorial. And uh, if you're not familiar with the ancestral place names of the land where you're located, there are a few resources that could help you with that. Um, for example, nativeland.ca is a website that you could look up. Uh, maybe I'll ask one of my colleagues to pop that in the chat as a resource. And there are some other um, similar resources online where you can do a bit of research to find the ancestral name of the lands where you're joining from. Uh, for those of you who, who don't know me, my name is Catherine Etmansky, and these days uh, with the guidance of uh, one of our colleagues named Asma Nahai Antoine, I've been introducing myself using my full name, Catherine Ella Kelsey Etmansky, because this starts to bring in my ancestors and bring in uh, the, the various streams of my family and helps to locate me in this global place and time acknowledging that my family's uh, settled in Canada, uh, from Scotland, from Poland, from Ireland, England, and the Netherlands. And, um, and my role at Royal Roads University is to serve as the director of the School of Leadership Studies. Throughout the pandemic, I've been so pleased to be working with my colleagues, the team on the line here today, uh, who uh, together we've been, we've been hosting a series of webinars about leading in these extraordinary times. And these current webinars, today's webinar and a few more that you'll learn about shortly, are really focused on the theme of global leadership and global, global leadership in these extraordinary times. And so Selena, next slide, please. This particular webinar is hosted by the Masters of Arts in Global Leadership and here to help ground us in this notion of global leadership is the program head, Dr. Wanda Krauss, whom I'll introduce momentarily. And uh, just while I have your attention, I'd also like to say thank you and give a little shout out to my colleagues Lisa Korak and Selena Kunar, who have been working behind the scenes tirelessly, not only to support the program, but to get us up and running today. So thank you to Selena and Lisa. And over to you, Dr. Dr. Wanda Krauss, to say a bit more about global leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Catherine. So hello, everyone. I am Wanda Krauss and program head of the Global Leadership Program. I'm located and speaking to you from the Wasanish traditional family lands, which is just outside of Royal Roads University. So also very beautiful lands on which I'm uh, beaming in from. And I'd like to introduce our speaker for today, uh, Suhail Tandon, who's speaking to you from his evening time, recognizing that many of you are on different time zones and in different areas in this world, as I could also see from the chat. Uh, so Suhail will be speaking about sport for development, which hooks into a local context within India, and also speaks to sport for development in many parts of the world. So I'm excited to hear what Sohail has to say uh, about his experience and the work his organization does. Sohail is a social entrepreneur and specializes in the sport and development field. His particular expertise is working with diverse groups of especially young persons. His background is in sports management, development, coaching, mentoring, and he has more than 10 years of experience in more than just within India as a location and case study. He works across many other countries, including the UK, here within Canada, and in different parts of India. He's the director and founder of Pro Sport Development, and he's an award-winning social, uh, which is an award-winning social enterprise. 
It's dedicated to utilizing sport for a holistic approach to development of both children and youth. So with that, I'd like to invite Suhail, if we can move to the next slide, Selena, please, to join us. And good evening, Suhail. Thank you, thank you, uh, Wanda, so much for that very kind introduction. Uh, and uh, hello to everyone. Uh, good morning to friends uh, joining from Canada. Uh, a late evening here in India, but really happy to be be part of this. And uh, thanks for Royal Roads University for having me um, and sharing my thoughts here. Um, so I've I've prepared a short presentation just to guide. Uh, my thoughts tonight and what I'm going to speak to all of you about. I'm just going to try and share that now. Um, so if you can see that, maybe you can put a thumbs up. Um, yes, we can, Sohail. Great, thank you. Uh, I'm going to keep uh, what I want to speak about short, not more than you know, 15 to 20 minutes because I'd like to actually hear from all of you as well and have time uh, for uh, Q and A's. Uh, it's also an opportunity for, for me to learn from all of you as well. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll quickly move into it. Um, I thought that I would start with uh, giving some background about uh, what, we, what we call SDP or what, how we define SDP, which is Sport for Development and Peace. And basically, um, SDP is uh, intentionally uh, comprises of intentionally designing sport, physical activity, and play in order to achieve some specific developmental outcomes and also promote peace. Uh, so, as you can see from the definition, SDP uses a very broad spectrum of of how we define sport. So, it includes physical activity, it includes play as well, um, and uh, basically. Uh, SDP uh, utilizes sport, physical activity, play, and play in, in, in a few very um, uh, specific manners. So uh, SDP um, you know, promotes inclusivity. It upholds the values and the integrities of the sporting experience. It provides a quality sporting experience, and it creates a safe space, uh, both physically uh, and otherwise. So these are some uh, qualities of SDP that distinguish it uh, from the, our traditional uh, notion of, of sport. Um, and why, why has SDP become uh, you know, so popular? So um, I think it's, uh, it's been the last two decades where sport for development and peace has really been acknowledged by global actors as a uh, as a tool to aid in various development and humanitarian uh, efforts globally and uh, even in india it's been gaining prominence uh, even as compared to a decade ago today there are many more organizations and projects on ground um, that are serving uh, you know young people and a host of other groups through sport so why is why uh, why is sport uh, you know so so good to utilize for for various development initiatives. Firstly, uh, you know, universal popularity uh, across the world. Uh, sport is played in sport, physical activity and play is um, uh, is taken part in some shape or form, and especially among young people. Um, sport has been seen as a good tool uh, for communication, uh, not just between uh, young people or, or the target groups you work with, but uh, even across various stakeholders. Sport has a global reach. Um, uh, today, you know, uh, professional sport reaches a, a wide um, uh, a variety of uh, audiences across the globe. Uh, and so everyone, uh, you know, um, knows about sport, has played sport. And, and you know, the sort of sport reaching uh, our homes now so easily in today's day and age has really inspired and motivated uh, many of us uh, uh, as well. 
sport is a very social activity uh, you know it helps to uh, get people together it helps uh, for people to interact with each other and sport is a very dynamic tool it can be used in various settings it can be used very differently uh, with uh, different uh, target groups and set of people um i think talking about uh, sdp without acknowledging its role uh, in the sdgs uh, would not be fair the sdgs uh, the sustainable development goals um uh, by the un as you all know uh came came uh, came to be in 2015 and they are a set of goals and targets uh for sustainable development that the world uh has signed up to and hopes to achieve by 2030 very early on in uh in in sort of the life cycle of the sdgs uh sport has been recognized as a as a key ally as a key Uh, enabler of these uh, sustainable development goals so the united nations itself in 2016 uh, recognized this um, the kazan action plan which came out of an interministerial intergovernmental meeting um, uh, held by unesco on sport and physical activity and physical education uh, adopted uh, a sport as uh, an important enabler of sdg and really a uh, put a spotlight on um, you know linking sport and sport policy with sustainable development what it also did was that it outlined 10 sdgs uh, out of the 17 and 36 associated targets uh, wherein sport uh, you know could could be uh, a, a tool uh, to to achieve those sdgs and targets um many other global actors such as uh, the commonwealth um and many other uh, international development agencies have really focused on on using sport for sustainable development and now uh, have been not just linking sport with achieving these uh, these goals and targets but for example the commonwealth commonwealth is now uh, developing a framework to globally um uh, to globally measure how sport is uh, is achieving various uh, sdgs and obviously uh, sport and uh, sdp um, is is a great tool uh, to use for for you development uh, we have seen it in our work uh, many others in the field have recognized it and have been using it for a long time uh, and and this has been uh, in various con contexts Uh, across the globe even in india it's uh, it's being used in in different parts of the country uh, in different settings both urban and rural um so it's 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 been a great tool and uh, and and from our work in this sector uh, you know we have seen that sdp um empowers you uh, especially girls and, and young women it's a lot of um, uh, actors are looking at sport Uh, as a tool uh, to not just empower girls and young women uh, but also uh, break the gender barriers uh, and strive for gender equality through sport um uh, sdp also has develops crit critical values and skills especially uh, that of leadership um it has Uh, enable young people to access and continue education and learning and this is again especially seen in the case of uh, uh, girls and and young women um sdp has also been a a, a good tool to uh, generate employment and livelihood for young people and this relates to the point above where it's developing those crit critical values and 21st century skills uh, for young people to become employable and gain meaningful employment um sdp promotes the inclusion of marginalized and vulnerable uh, youth groups um for example in india um many projects and organizations uh, are working with those uh, young people on the margins whether they are from scheduled caste groups or from indigenous uh, uh, groups um uh, and then uh, like i was saying uh, you know sdp has been a great uh, tool 
for young people to be sensitized on issues of uh, of gender of sexuality um and and adolescent health and that's gain, gaining a lot of prominence uh, across across the globe so uh how does all this come into a uh, play on on uh, um on the ground uh, you know so how 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 does sdp play out on the ground uh, what i've done here is uh, i've i'm going to just stop sharing my current screen and i'm going to share my uh, screen i'm going to show all of you a short video uh, and basically the video should give you a a good idea of um sorry i think that's the wrong screen should give you a good idea of how uh, how sdp looks like on the ground um so if you can hear the video and see it you can just give a give a thumbs up The community sports program works with marginalized children between the ages of 5 and 16 years residing in various slum settlements across the city of Bhubaneswar in Odisha in eastern India. Since 2015 the community sports program has worked with more than 2800 children with 45% of them being girls. The community sports program utilizes a well-researched multi-sport curriculum that aids in the holistic development of children. It empowers children to become confident and competent leaders within their own communities. The community sports program focuses on the participation on females and promotes the equal partnership between girls and boys. The community sports program is designed to enable select goals part of the united nations sustainability development agenda em to tournament sabu jagare hue ni kintu ame eti bahut kichu sikhiwa gulche jemte ki em to team ache kebal jhio kuniate nal kebal phuo kuniante eta gote mix mix hochi agenda jo ki phuo bila be khali paribe jhio bila be khali paribe eti kaha ko be kam ni aun phuo bila ne jhio bila ko pass kor gulche jhio bila ne phuo bila ko ball pass kor chande au amar bitaru bahut team bitaru coordination takara cooperation with for sondi seta be ame dekhilu encouragement bahut ame ache dekhilu au nije nije bitare mane competition mind na rakhi ki se mane फ्रेंडली खेलसन दे मैच ताको एडा हम बहुत सिखाव पाइल आ बहुत नवा नवा फ्रेंड भी मुआ दे छी सो दैट वाज आई एम जस्ट गोना शेयर माय प्रेजेंटेशन अगेन अम दैट वाज वन ऑफ आवर प्रोग्राम्स दैट वी रन इन इन ईस्टर्न इंडिया एंड इट जस्ट शोस यू हाउ हाउ अ अ स्पोर्ट फॉर development and peace program looks on ground um so moving along um just a bit about a uh, pro sport development now i know wanda gave uh, a very uh, a good introduction uh, of us um we are basically a, a social enterprise uh, that uses sport to aid in the holistic development of uh, children and young people um and since uh, uh since 2013 we have uh, worked across 15 states uh, in india and we've not just implemented uh, sport for development programs we've designed many sports for development programs as well as uh, worked towards evaluating uh, various sdp programs uh, in 2018 um we were uh, honored to have been recognized by the international olympic committees sport and active society commission for outstanding work in the area of sport for all it was truly a uh, um a recognition that really made us believe in what we were doing and uh, scale that work up and and take it forward um as you can see uh, below uh, i've provided the vision of our organization and, and it very much focuses on working with marginalized uh, uh, and underprivileged young people providing them access to their fundamental right of uh, participating in in sport physical activity and and play 
um, but also uses uh, sport as a tool uh, to allow and enable them to become um, uh, you know confident and competent individuals um, so our, our work is basically divided into uh, three um, or, or three verticals or you know three stakeholders that we primarily work with the first is directly working with children uh, and young people uh, secondly we work with different types of facilitators who in turn work with young people through sport and finally we also work with institutions working in the sport uh, and development sector i'll talk just a little bit about uh, these three areas of of work as well um so in our uh, in our first area of work we basically develop and implement uh, sdp sdp programs for for young people uh, as you saw the video that's the video of our community sports program which we've been running since 2015 in eastern india and the objectives of our sdp programs are to teach various skills including soft skills to enhance the socio emotional development of of young people and also a very important component of our programming is to change uh, the attitudes of young people towards other genders uh, and really uh, breaking the gender stereotypes that exist uh, all our programming uh, for young people is delivered in mixed gender groups which is quite uh, unique especially uh, in india um, it it takes a lot more work to do something like that uh, but at the end we found that it's it's a very beneficial not just to the young people but to the schools and communities they belong to and like you see our long term goal of these um uh, of these programs is to empower young people to become leaders within their own communities and to uh, really uh, to go forward and and achieve in in their lives our second area of work is with uh, facilitators so these can include uh, sports coaches grassroots trainers pe teachers trainers working specifically in the sport for development uh, and peace sector and what we do is we design and implement uh, tailored training workshops um, which basically uh, help these uh, these facilitators in enhancing their delivery and outcomes of the sport and development programs they deliver for young people uh, we also help um, facilitators and organizations Uh, design uh, various type of uh, sdp resources and curriculums uh, that again um, can enhance uh, their their programming finally uh, our work uh, with institutions involves providing uh, various types of uh, organizations working in the sport and development sector with uh, technical expertise uh, ranging from strategy development to research and evaluations and to documentation and advocacy uh, again the objective is to support these institutions to create sustainable impact through sport um just going going back i wanted to give you a few examples of the kind of work we've done in these areas so for example in terms of working with facilitators um we uh, we've one of the projects i want to talk about is working with a set of uh, uh, young leaders all girls uh, from rural rajasthan uh, a state in north india uh, basically uh, they were part of a football program um, for young girls um, and uh, basically the organization they were linked to wanted to now take this football pro program forward so we trained uh, these young uh, uh, girls as a uh, football facilitators who could take the program to more uh, number of girls in the in the villages and make the program more sustainable um in terms of our work with institutions we work with a variety of organizations across india as well as globally uh, we've done work with organizations like oxfam india uh, helping them design a, a a strategy for them to use uh, sport for women and girls uh, as part of the gender justice work we we are currently working with laureus sport for gold as part of their model city delhi uh, program uh, we've been working with uh, the international platform for sport and development which is one of the largest uh, global platforms uh, for sport 
uh, and development uh, as their communications partner. So these are kind of uh, uh, you know um, uh, things that we do uh, in these areas of of work. Again, all of these link to our mission of uh, enhancing the lives of young people and aiding in their holistic development through sport. Um, this is uh, the outreach uh, that we've achieved since our inception. Um, I'll just leave that on um, for a couple of more seconds. Um, and yeah, just a, a few things before I end in terms of how you could get involved with us. I mean, today's uh, in today's day and age, the first call is always, uh, uh, you know, get acquainted with our social media, follow us, join us, join our conversations. So we are on a host of social media platforms. You can learn more about us through our website, www.prosportdev.in. Uh, do feel free to get in touch uh, uh, about learning more about our work, supporting our work, including volunteering opportunities. Uh, COVID has really taught us uh, how we can work better remotely. And we've had a few volunteers and intern interns work with us remotely as well. You can also sign up to our mailing list and subscribe to our monthly newsletter, which provides all the updates about our work. Um, you can also find this at the bottom of our website. And finally, do watch out for our annual global fundraiser where you can directly contribute to, to one of our programs. Uh, so again, I'm just mindful of the time and I'll leave it at that. Um, and um, yeah, I hope the floor is open to comments, questions, uh, any discussions, any thoughts you might have. Thank you, Sahail. This was uh, quite a condensed overview of the many, many wonderful things your organization is doing. So thank you for that overview and uh, essentially introduction. I, I really loved um, to hear, and this is not the first time I'm, I'm hearing of what your organization is doing, but just as a reminder of the great work and thinking around strategy. So using sport as a tool for empowerment, um, to hear that as one avenue for empowerment and leader, leadership skill development is, I feel, absolutely crucial. Um, and I appreciate your focus, especially on youth. Um, we hear very recently uh, what's happening in the UK. Uh, I'm sure many listeners are aware of with referees being discriminated against um, who are black and Asian and from minority communities. So uh, I, have a, uh, I have a question around that uh, coming up to hear a little bit more about your thinking. But what I'd love to do is turn it over to our, our attendees and listeners to hear what your questions are for Sahil today. You may simply uh, either put your hand up with the function we have with under the reactions button, most likely below on your screen. Wanda, we have a great question in our chat box. Um, so the question reads, is SDP funded by the UN and available for all countries around the world? Great question. Um, so SDP is definitely uh, championed by the UN uh, and many other uh, intergovernmental and international organizations. Uh, some SDP programming is definitely funded by the UN and its various, um, you know, bodies. Uh, but a lot of uh, SDP funding actually happens uh, through, our, uh, you know, the usual development funding channels. Uh, so in some countries, it's uh, government-led. In some countries, there's a greater focus on uh, private institutional funding. For example, in, in some countries, uh, um, funding by the corporate social responsibility arms of companies has gained prominence. A lot of funding for support for development and peace also happens through uh, crowdfunding campaigns. Um, uh, 
but uh, also recently at least in the last uh, 10 uh, years um, many of the sport federations and international sports federations uh, have really been focusing on using sport as a tool for good um, so that includes uh, you know IOC FIFA UEFA the international table tennis federation uh, has been focusing on this for the last few years so there are lots of different avenues uh, of funding and uh, SDP programming, the, the second part of your question, SDP programming actually happens across the globe. Uh, it, it is a niche area uh, of, of the development sector, but uh, you know, it, it sort of it, excellent programs are taking place globally and, and you know, are being supported by, um, by a variety of, of stakeholders. So the UN definitely champions uh, SDP. Uh, it definitely does support some as sdb programs but i think it's it's a, a group of stakeholders that's really taken the the sector forward great thank you for that question and i see ahmed hamadi has a question you can just unmute yourself and go ahead and ask oh thank you very much and uh, it was a great uh, presentation and thank you uh, for giving me a chance to ask uh, I was wondering if the, uh, the, the this program is uh, is uh, how, how convenient were you when you were implementing this program in India from the government side? Was the government willing to allow such programs, or is there a, a cooperation uh, like a cooperation with you, or or they are not cooperating? In, uh, I, I, in in some states, they they probably have strict rules or their own rules or 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 some uh, some uh, some time of restrictions. That not allow uh, women or girls um, in in giant sports or, or like from the religious perspectives or, or from their cultural perspectives. So, were there troubles implementing? Like, what kind of uh, troubles did you face uh, when you implementing uh, these programs in, in in rural India? India. Thank you. Thanks for your question. I think that's an excellent question. Um, Lots of challenges, definitely, when we started. Um, I think in uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the government, um, though there was not much support in the beginning uh, in terms of any financial support or recognition, there wasn't many um, restrictions from their side either. Um, um, however, the you know the. Uh, I think it's good to understand how sport is viewed in India um, by the government, by uh, uh, the people, by parents, by teachers. Uh, there's a, a social construct of sport that puts an emphasis on performance, on winning medals, but ha hardly on participation and and uh, you know the sort of the intangibles that you that you can get from participating in sport. And that's a big factor that's missing. Um, so that actually uh, was a bigger uh, uh, hindrance and mostly from the uh, side of schools, parents. And then obviously you have social constructs of gender uh, that are uh, prevalent uh, uh, in India. And you know there was a, some pushback from parents, there was pushback from uh, from teachers, so we realized very quickly that we had to work with these important stakeholders. The young, the young people, the children were always open. Some of them obviously would have been hesitant to play with uh, someone from another gender if they hadn't done so, or play at all. Many of the girls we worked with have have never participated in sport or in organized uh, physical activity before, and some boys as well. Uh, so I think. Um, uh, really, advocacy was very important. Taking time out to speak to these different key stakeholders was important. In terms of the government, now, yes, there's a recognition coming in. Um, there is a big emphasis on sport in India in general. But I think they also realize, uh, everyone realizes that if, if young people don't participate in sport, then we can't also win medals at the Olympics because right now even though we are we have a country uh, a billion of a billion plus people uh, the the number of young people participating in sport there's no there's no numbers but 
it's much smaller than it should be for a country of our size. Uh, there's no dearth of cha uh, talent at all. Um, so I think uh, that's prompted the government to see uh, participative particip participation in sport as very important as well. Um, for example, uh, one of the states that we work in called Odisha, which is in Eastern India, is uh, and the community sports program is run in the capital of Odisha called Bhubaneswar. Odisha is becoming the sporting capital of India in the last six years. Bhubaneswar has hosted the Hockey Men's World Cup um, in 2018. It's currently hosting the Ho Youth Hockey World Cup for the second time in Bhubaneswar. It's held many other uh, international competitions and it's really developed its sporting infrastructure. But as you can see, a lot of it is geared towards elite participation uh, and elite sport. Uh, so now they are obviously realizing that this won't work without a strong grassroots system. Uh, and and so, so the government support will come in, uh, but it's this, uh, is how sport is viewed that actually needs to change um, for, for, you know, more uh, young people to, to be able to participate in sport. And obviously, uh, uh, those social constructs is something that we try to break through our programs and many others do as well. Uh, and that's um, not, not easy to do. And, and that's not a law or a rule or a restriction from the government, but it's, it's everywhere. Um, it's in families, it's in uh, institutions. And that's something that we have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, thank you very much. A, a, a very short question, another one. Uh, sorry for um, uh, too many questions. Uh, do you, when you find a good talent in, in the rural area, in a very poor area, how, how far do you guys support that talent to become a, a world talent or, or become a famous talent in the, uh, over all India? So uh, is there like a specific program for that talent to, to train in a specific way or just generally you just promote it to some level or how? Good question. We actually, that's not our focus. So if we do see a good talent, we will connect them to a program uh, or a government led, say, um, uh, academy, sports academy, where they can take that talent forward. For us, uh, it's a more sport for all, for all approach and to ensure their participation and learning from sport. Uh, we did start as a sport development uh, organization where our objective was to develop the sporting talent of, of young people. Uh, and we believe that uh, we believed in working with young people who didn't have the means, but had the talent. So we started by working um, with a group of indigenous uh, young people in the state of Odisha. And over the two and a half years we worked with them, uh, we saw great sporting results. They won about 25 medals at national level. Uh, but very soon we realized that a sport was having a much larger impact. And one example stands out, um, a, 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 a very promising weightlifter who was about 14, 15, never returned to school after the summer holidays. And, and we found out that uh, she'd gotten married. So that struck us very hard. And we realized that, you know, we couldn't just use sport um, for their sporting development. So so that's where we pivoted. And now we, we basically just focus on on using sport as a as a tool uh, to to um, enrich the lives of young people, and if there is talent, and obviously there is always talent, we do connect it to uh, other programs uh, and academies where they can uh, pursue that as well. Thank you for all those details and answer, Selena. I see you have your hand up. Please jump in. Hi, yes, I had a great question come in via private message in the chat box. Um, so we have someone here wondering, how did you decide uh, what, what sports and activities you'd be offering to move forward um, peace and development? And I'll note that we have uh, Badminton Ontario and Karate Canada in the chat box as well. So if you feel comfortable or eager, feel free to, to share your reflections in the chat box as well. Uh, great question. Um, so I, as I was alluding to, we um, 
we did start with a program where um, we worked with young people to develop their sporting talent and we used a few specific sports. We also did uh, implement a physical education program for all the children in, in, in the schools. Um, we, but we, we, uh, when we pivoted from working, um, from using sport as a tool, uh, we actually thought that almost a physical education, physical activity program would be the best way to go. Uh, so we actually, uh, the community sports program, the video that you saw, we have over the years uh, developed, refined, and, and still continue to work on a multi-sport and multi-activity program, uh, which is designed for uh, kids between uh, ages 5 to 15. And basically, uh, it's centered around teaching uh, those young people uh, various soft skills and, and values. Uh, and for younger kids, it's focusing on more on physical literacy. And we use about eight, uh, eight sporting disciplines uh, to inform the curriculum. So badminton is one of the games, football, cricket, handball. But we basically adapt activities and games around those sporting disciplines. And what that does is uh, it ensures that everyone is on a level, level playing field. So all the games and activities are new. And they're designed such that, uh, uh, you know, it's an in inclusive program. And this we especially saw uh, when we had girls and boys in, in the same group. Many boys access informal spaces to play sport, such as playgrounds and parks, but girls never did. So if we started by playing a cricket match or a football game, they would have a bit of an edge because they would, they would have that skill having been having participated before, but we break that down. Uh, and then when, and then we do single sport mixed gender tournaments where we see uh, everyone being on, on, uh, on a level playing field. So that was a, a great way to, I think, uh, uh, take forward the values that we wanted uh, as part of the program. But since then we have used single sports. Uh, for example, we are currently working with the International Table Tennis Federation Foundation on a table tennis program. So we've now designed a whole program around table tennis. But again, it's the end goal is to help uh, boys and girls play table tennis together and in the process, uh, br uh, break various gender stereotypes within their own communities. Um, we've used an indigenous and rural sport called Coco, which is a running and chasing game to develop um, a digital literacy program uh, around that uh, using Coco and smartphones. So uh, it basically, uh, uh, it's a matter of how uh, you design it. And that's why in the on my first slide, I think I said intentional design of sport uh, is a key, uh, key part of, uh, of SDP. Uh, so I think you can take uh, any, any sport, you can take karate, you can take badminton and design it such uh, that you can actually uh, have uh, key uh, developmental outcomes from that. So that's sort of been our uh, our journey. And I think multi-sports is something uh, that's really worked well for us. All right, any other questions? Catherine, I see your video is now on. <laughs> you must have one. Well, thanks, Wanda, and thank you so much, Suhil. It's really just um, so very inspiring to hear about your work. And uh, for people in the audience who might not know, I have heard you speak about your work before, and I've been following you on social media for a little while now. And I'm just so struck by the stories you've been telling um, in terms of how you're using sport for more holistic development. Like, yes, of course, it's about the, the athletic skills and the physical activity, but something you said to me in, on another occasion really, really struck me that it's the idea of sport for leisure, not just for competition, not just to win awards for the school or to, to get a scholarship to move on to higher education, etc. Can you say a little bit more? You, you've talked about it uh, so far a little bit, but just go into a bit more depth, maybe with some stories about 
how these mixed gender sports teams, you were just describing on the cricket pitch, for example, and how the boys had an advantage at first, but girls can, can come, into, um, come into their own in that game as well. Can you talk a bit about how you support the, you know, just passing uh, between boys and girls, for example, or how you support the fair play and the ideas of gender equality in the context of the game? What would that look like? And how, how, would, how would you animate that kind of a teaching amongst the young, the young people who are playing together? Uh, thanks, Catherine. Again, interesting question. So again, I think it comes down to how you design and facilitate uh, the program. Uh, so for example, we might have a simple uh, game where the ball needs to be passed uh, from one teammate to the other to score a goal. Now that could be using your feet, using your hands. And what happens is in a game, uh, you know, the facilitator might realize that um, the boy is only passing to the boys and excluding the girls. And so there are provisions in our curriculum that can progress the game or change the game and, and then ch make a, a, a rule that uh, if, if a boy has the ball, they have to pass it to a girl. Otherwise, the ball goes to the other team. So small rule changes uh, then force them uh, to change the actions and then there's a debrief around that uh, after the game uh, you know uh, and there's a discussion around it uh, and then when uh, so when we first started the these mixed gender tournaments uh, again it wasn't perfect some teams came into the tournament and um, you know the boys started pass passing to the boys there we didn't have a rule the only rule was that if there are eight players on the pitch, at least half have to be uh, girls or half have to be boys. Uh, and what interestingly happened, the teams that had had the best coordination between them played as a team and included everyone in the team, which includes both boys and girls, actually did well in the tournament. The teams that are only passing to the boys did not. So again, there was learning and, you know, these again then fed into the discussions and the program that that we that we had what was um, great to see after a few uh, tournaments was that we then didn't have to really um, you know we didn't have to really intervene that much uh, you know they the young people had um, had sort of internalized what worked to win a match so it wasn't about it was about including everyone and those are values they learned, but also in order to achieve a goal, they had to involve everyone and have everyone as as uh, as key members of the team. And I think the best thing that we saw at these tournaments was how freely boys and girls were interacting on the pitch, but also off the pitch. And uh, and uh, you know that won't happen necessarily in their schools or communities. Uh, so so again, in just a bit of intentional design and facilitation can go a long way um, in sort of, um, you know, helping them realize, um, you know, um, what they can do differently and, and make, you know, their, not just their uh, playgrounds, but their classrooms and, and their homes more inclusive, more inviting to everyone. Thanks for that Thanks, question. Sahil. Catherine, um, I have one more question, Sahil, that I want to come back to. <laughs> Uh, given that we have very little time, I'll just ask very quickly. So, um, as you know, the scandals that have um, been brought to light around Black referees being excluded, as well Asian and those from other minority groups, from the Premier League and other very top um, positions in the UK. This is just one example that comes to light. Obviously, this is around the world. <laughs> Um, the case. And I'm, I'm curious how, if we think about shifting cultures and you're beginning with youth who are not only leaders, becoming leaders now as youth, but they are also our future adult leaders. What is, what is your thinking around that? How can we shift cultures around the world, uh, specifically in sport, 
or through sport, such as in this example? Um, yeah, I mean, um, I think first thing that uh, we all must acknowledge is sport is not perfect. Sport is part of society, which is not perfect. And I think, um, yes, we, we all allude to the power of sport uh, to bring about change. But I think that doesn't happen by itself. There's a lot of, uh, like I said, thinking that goes behind how to utilize sport. There's a lot of designing around it. So I think, A, it is acknowledging that just because a sport is such a powerful tool, it's such an engaging tool that sport in itself is, is you know, is, uh, you, you can't really see it away from the existing issues in society. So I think that we all must take into uh, into account um, and also sort of introspect, um, you know, so it's not just uh, how we, you know, it's not just because we run sports programs for both boys and girls that, you know, we, we don't have any gender issues, for example. So I think introspection is first and, and not just um, what you do uh, on the pitch, but also internally how you're running your organizations. And I think that is something that needs to be looked at. I mean, you allude to the example about racism in refereeing. Uh, racism has come up in, in cricket, which is a sport I follow very closely in the UK, in South Africa, uh, on a big scale, institutional racism. So I think uh, that's one thing. And I think um, one thing is that all delivery of sport, I believe, must be sort of value-based, value-led, uh, you know, sport, everyone talks about these values associated with sport. Uh, I mean, the IOC promotes them at the highest levels, but how is that trickling down to our everyday experiences of sport? So I think uh, that is very important. And I think sometimes we do lose sight of that because sport has become such a professional uh, pursuit. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's been a, I mean, sport uh, has become a huge industry in itself. Uh, but I think we can't lose sight of that. Uh, because if uh, all I mean, when I reflect of, you know, uh, playing sport, and now when I reflect back, it is some of those values that I've taken forward into not just my work, but my everyday life today. Uh, so I think there's, uh, I think we need to be more cognizant of these uh, of these values and uh, whatever level and whatever type of sport uh, we are playing, I think those need to be um, sort of highlighted and especially working with, with young people. Uh, you know, I can see uh, in my own experiences how sport used to be delivered 20 years back is changing now with, with a young set of coaches. You know, they, they deliver sport more inclusively, uh, they have, uh, you know, uh, this sort of value-driven approach. So there are things changing slightly, but I think, um, yeah, just introspecting on how sort of we run sport and sporting organizations, but also focusing on those values of sport is, is very important. Thank you so much, Sahail, for that answer. And thank you so much for your presentation. There are so many really beautiful nuggets that I'd love to tease out. And I see that we're at time. So I just want to say thank you so much for spending this time with us and offering your wisdoms and experiences. Um, so thanks so much. Thank you so much for having me. And with that, I'll turn it over to Catherine to uh, talk a little bit about the program and perhaps some of the skills that you've mentioned also, Sohail, that we teach in the program and, and try to support. Over to you, Catherine. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Suhail. Uh, now's the time where we could really use those reaction uh, tabs, you know, if you want to send uh, Suhail a little bit of love or some encouragement, some applause uh, using the reactions, please go ahead and do so. Uh, we're, we're just so pleased that you joined us, Suhail, and, um, you know, it's been interesting working uh, across time zones, which, of course, is a big, big part of uh, a global leadership skill. It's something 
that seems kind of small and taken for granted, but I noticed there were people coming in from all around the world. So we're, we're constantly now uh, in this global context, thinking about what time is it where with the person I want to, to connect with. So thank you, Suhail, very uh, useful um, insights. We wish you the very best for your ongoing good work in the world. And I'll just ask my colleague, Selena, if you wouldn't mind putting uh, another slide back up for me to, to speak about. Um, while you're doing that, perhaps I'll just mention, and of course, Wanda and Lisa um, are here to answer any questions you may have if you'd like to follow up with them. With the Global Leadership Program, we've got a wonderful suite of programs. Um, we have uh, master's degrees, which you can take in an on-campus format, or you could take in a blended format, and by blended we mean mostly online with a few residential experiences. So on-campus experiences for two weeks uh, in the first year and two weeks again in the second year. Uh, so there's the, the on-campus, the blended, there's an accelerated version of this. And there are a couple of different um, graduate diplomas and certificates that ladder into the master's degree as well. So there's a whole suite of programs. And I'll just ask one of my colleagues to put a link to the MAGL programs in the chat box for anyone who would like more information. Of course, we're here to answer questions as well. And Selena, if you don't mind uh, clicking to the next slide, we have a few more webinars coming up in this particular series on global leadership. Uh, from local to global leadership. So the next one's coming up in January. Uh, can you believe it's almost 2022? I can't, I can't believe it. Uh, food security from an Indigenous perspective. So that's coming up January 18th, 9 a.m. Pacific time. So take note of that wherever you may be in the world. And we've got another one. This, this is a topic that's very interesting, particularly to the higher education sector, uh, but also for people working in other sectors as well. The idea of internationalization and global leadership. That one's coming up February 15th, again, 9 a.m. Pacific time. And Selena, if you wouldn't mind putting the next slide, here's how you can get in touch with us. Uh, we have some enrollment advisors, international admissions and registration. And of course, if you would like to contact either Lisa or Wanda or me directly, you can send a note to leadership.admin at royalroads.ca and that will get straight through to us. So I'd like to thank you again, everyone who was involved in organizing today's webinar. We're here to support, we're here to answer questions. And Suhail, what wonderful work. Wish you all the best. Thanks for joining everyone. Have a great day.